I guess we'll get started. Um, so I'll briefly introduce uh, Professor Ed Perot, who's a professor uh, in aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech. He's been there since, uh, he's been there since 2005. Prior to that, he was at MIT from uh, 93 uh, through 2005. Um, and his uh, talk today is going to talk about uh, proof carrying auto coding for embedded uh, control software. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Maria, for uh, uh, taking over my, uh, my lack of timeliness uh, this morning. Uh, it's, it's really nice to have colleagues who are willing to, uh, to step in like that. Uh, so uh, yes, I want to talk about uh, uh, a very traditional uh, topic, autocoding. Uh, for control software, but with a twist, uh, which is, uh, let's add the proofs uh, into it. Uh, safety critical so embedded software, that's how it's called outside the controls community, um, is best designed to a proper specification followed by automatic coding of specification and their semantics. Um, now, why is it best done? Uh, why, why do we um, want to encode the semantics of the software, what it does, the meaning of it, uh, together with the, the software itself? Well, this is what we're going to talk about uh, today. And, uh, but one thing is that it is the next best step uh, for the controlled community who is interested in controlling things that are dangerous. Uh, to leverage the domain-specific knowledge uh, further than uh, the transactions and automatic control. Uh, and I will talk about the control example, and then I will uh, venture in the direction of collision avoidance systems, which I'm getting interested in. I'm in aerospace, so I worry mostly about stuff that can kill you, uh, and uh, which is quite different from other applications of control. Uh, on the other hand, since everybody flies, <laughs> you're mine or mine. Uh, so I will skip the presentation, the, the introduction, and uh, talk directly about safety critical software. So what's, what's that? What's safety critical software? It's what I just said. A software that interacts in real time with the physical system, usually big and heavy, or very costly, or extra dangerous. Uh, and uh, may also interact with humans. So you have aircraft, rockets. Uh, missiles and uh, last but not least, uh, radiotherapy machines. Uh, the last example in date of people being toasted by a radiotherapy machine seems to be in France. Uh, operators not knowing how the machine worked managed to get the machine to roast the patient uh, way beyond uh, the uh, uh, medium rare level. Uh, so. Uh, in terms of applications, these are the ones I'm interested in. Uh, aircraft, missiles, rockets, uh, for different reasons. Uh, so for the aircraft, it's because of the money involved. Uh, so the productivity of a uh, software engineer working on the avionic systems of an aircraft is about 0 0.6 lines of code per hour. Uh, that's uh, everything included, okay? Of course, I mean, you, we, we talk from, from idea to operation, okay? 0 0.6 line of code per hour. And then you look at the different aircraft that came out in the recent past. You know, the F-22 uh, contains about 1.7 million lines of code uh, related to the avionics. Uh, the F-35 is 5.7 million lines of code, and then the Boeing 787 is 6.5 million lines of code. So um, you, you, you can do the algebra, and uh, you end up with the cost of about $1.7 billion uh, invested by Boeing in the Boeing 787 software component alone. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who like uh, programming, I mean, so it's, it's nice. Uh, also, the, the, the trend is interesting. Right? Uh, the Airbus A320, I think, had uh, still has, by the way, 20,000 lines of code running. And now we're like, uh, you know, several others of magnitude above that. Um, Walter Gillette was the program manager for the uh, 
777, uh, a legacy system, is, first it was designed last century, you know, so it's, it's, it says a lot about it. Back then, the systems component of uh, the design and development program for the 777 represented about half of the total cost to Boeing. And then within that, that uh, systems component, Software development and software verification represented a total of 70% of that half. So, meaning software and software verification represents about 30, uh, is, uh, represents about 35% of the total cost of development of an aircraft by, which by all standards is now legacy stuff. Okay, it's not even the most recent one. So I let you imagine what the trend is, but it's certainly uh, is consistent with the uh, price estimate that I gave you before. I mean, we are always in the billion dollar range, okay? Now, uh, you can ask Panos, uh, you know, what what, how much of that share of the aircraft is covered by aerospace engineering? And uh, he doesn't seem to be laughing, me neither. Uh, but it's not much. Uh, so, in terms of accident incidents, um, so yes, so there was the FARAC 25, which was like the, uh, the first uh, machine uh, exhibiting some important uh, issues uh, in terms of safety. Uh, the F-22 had some interesting stories when it tried to cross the date change line. Uh, they had to make a, <laughs> they were defeated by the Pacific Ocean. They had to make a U-turn. Um, because they just could not cross that line without the avionics going like wacko. Uh, Iron 5 was, uh, uh, had a problem of its own. And then, um, and then the Patriot uh, also uh, due to a uh, uh, floating uh, point uh, computation error uh, ended up killing its own rather than the other guys and actually the other missiles. Uh, so what kind of remedies do you have for addressing these uh, failures? Uh, well, let me say right away that simulations are super useful, that they should never be done away with. Uh, they offer extreme flexibility. You can do simulations all in software. You can do simulations that evolve, involve both software and hardware, so hardware and loop simulation. They're extremely flexible, and that's why people love them, because you can test anything. Really. Um, however, uh, people felt a little bit uh, frustrated uh, by that, because simulations just test, whether you like it or not, a finite set of operating points. And this, is f uh, this falls short of what uh, is expected, which is a more thorough coverage of everything that the software does, either alone or in collaboration with uh, a piece of hardware. Uh, thus, uh, the tools devoted to static program analysis, uh, named model checking, uh, abstract interpretation, um, there, are, there are competing, uh, competing uh, approaches to uh, software verification. Uh, and these are mostly uh, interested in making sure that the state space of the software being examined never gets into some dangerous area. Okay. Then you have other uh, tools, for example, for worst case execution time analysis. And uh, usually when you come up with this kind of analysis, you end up trying to, having to develop proofs, okay, and uh, develop proofs for whatever statements you're bringing forward, and that's where third improvers come handy, such as PDS, or Cock, or Isabel, or other uh, tools like that. By the way, I keep an eye on Cyan, just in case I say something stupid, then I will, he will nod his face, and I, then I will know I said something stupid. Uh, there is a certain scarcity of available test cases, uh, meaning that, uh, for understandable reason, Boeing will not brag about uh, the latest bug it encountered, and neither will uh, Honeywell, nor Rockwell Collins, nor Northrop Grumman, etc., etc. So as a result, you see some interesting situations uh, like the paparazzi autopilot, uh, which is meant for the small UAVs, but that wide, uh, being uh, heralded uh, by NASA on its uh, list of uh, static analysis milestones, 
uh, for his uh, verification validation flight control systems program, therefore making it all the way to Congress. Okay. Uh, so um, so that's, that makes things a little bit harder. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, I want to talk more about design. And the reason is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, I was trained in engineer, so I cannot help but design things. Uh, you know, and uh, and if uh, if uh, truth doesn't suit me, I just I break it and move on. Uh, the uh, the other reason is because I was uh, I was looking for about seven years at this uh, software thing. You know, I, I was basically gaping in front of the 1.7 billion dollar number, saying how can I get a grab? Uh, how can I have like uh, even a small share of that stuff? I mean, this is good. This is good stuff. You know. I mean, of course, um, my fellow from IBM would probably uh, agree that the, the total number uh, in terms of cost of induced by mistakes uh, software-wise exceeds $60 billion uh, per year. Okay, that is if you go away from aerospace alone and you include everything else. Uh, so anyway, good opportunity, but absolutely zero idea <laughs> made me, uh, may put me in a sort of an odd situation. Uh, but having uh, had my uh, U.S. citizenship back in 2009, I kept gaping at the money. And uh, I decided that finally there was one approach to be followed that could probably work. It is to go back to what I know best, which is controls, and try to do software engineering from a controls perspective, which is uh, what I and uh, I assume a few of you know best. Uh, so looking at this, I started looking at uh, these tools named autocoding tools. Uh, where, because it, it felt very much like home over there. Um, so, for example, you can recognize uh, the real-time workshop and uh, from the MathWorks, okay, and Simulink and stuff like that. You know, this is, this is good stuff. It was not the first environment allowing you to specify a system, control system among others, graphically, uh, and then uh, allowing you to just produce uh, executable code right away. Um, the first code was, uh, that I understand uh, happened was this thing named Picture2Code, which uh, feels very much like Simulink, but it was designed in 1982 at Pratt & Whitney. Okay. And up until about a couple of years ago, uh, they kept using uh, Picture2Code uh, as an in-house tool. Uh, not much available uh, about it, but Except that, the, except that, uh, I mean, most of us have flown in aircraft uh, pushed by Pratt and Whitney engines, and you know it's, we're still alive, so that's good. Uh, other tools, uh, more uh, that are it's sort of developing very hard uh, these days, are uh, uh, the SCADE uh, by uh, Estelle Technologies is uh, is becoming uh, the de facto standard. I once asked a guy who was working for Gulfstream how they did their control logs, and I said. Well, we put our skate, uh, our skate uh, diagrams together. We ship them to Thales in uh, Thales Avionics in Toulouse, and they, s they email us back the code. I'm like, okay, fine. And uh, <coughs> and you have other more experimental systems uh, in place, such as Gini Auto, uh, which is from Toulouse, and Griffon Rockwell Collins, which is uh, from Rockwell Collins in uh, Cedar Rapids. So uh, my question was, how do we reconcile analysis and design? How do I reconcile uh, the fact that I design control system and I code them, and, um, and then that some people look at uh, those systems and want to analyze them? Uh, so for that, I want to take an example that I've covered a couple of times, and I'm sure you've seen in your classes, especially the mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers, uh, mass spring system. Okay. <coughs> And what I want to do is explore, uh, explain to you a little bit the story that I've uh, e explained uh, from a 30,000 feet high uh, down to the uh, test table. So this mass spring system, you can uh, you input the force, you output uh, the position. Uh, there is a spring present there to make la matters uh, slightly uh, more complicated. And you want to design a position feedback uh, for this system. Uh, so although an integrator is absolutely necessary to get exact position, I hate integrators, therefore what we did, or what I did, is I designed a lead lag controller, the lag to get the performance and the lead to get the stability, okay? So without going into the details, okay, those who don't understand transfer functions, uh, you come see me after recess. 
and uh, but you get like a lead lag compensator, uh, which uh, basically gets the job done uh, with like appropriate rise time and uh, overshoot and settling time. Uh, but again, this is a fairly easy system. So what does the controller do? What does the designer do? The designer goes on, okay, and uh, and then decides to implement these things. So how does he implement this thing? He writes down some sort of simulating diagram. Okay, forget about the days when people were coding things even in MATLAB. By now, it's all done by simulating. One of my students made an artificial vision system entirely on simulating. I, I was pretty amazed at the performance. I mean, the, the, the whole signal, the whole image processing was just a bunch of simulating diagram. And, um, and uh, so he goes into that uh, simulating environment, codes it in, okay? Or to be more precise, codes in a uh, uh, discretized version of the controller, maybe, or let simulating decide how the discretization should be done. It's, uh, it's probably more than what should be expected from, uh, from today's undergraduate crowd. And, uh, and, then, um, and then usually, well, does the following, uh, passes it on to the next team, okay? Uh, in the case of uh, control uh, laboratory at uh, Illinois or elsewhere, uh, the, the rest of the team is basically the computer. You just press the enter button, okay? And there is also the big red button in case the plant goes crazy. Uh, in the case of industry, um, it is a, usually a completely different team who does the verification and validation of uh, the entire piece of software that was produced by uh, Simulink, uh, Real-Time Workshop, or Matrix X. Uh, and by the way, the standards for verification in aviation industry and other super dangerous industry is that whatever has been autocoded deserves the same treatment as if, we, if it were coded by hand. Okay? That is, you, you go through the whole thing. Okay? Uh, you do uh, test cases, you do like, unit testing, you do, you, you do all, the, all the things that uh, basically cost you a fortune. But from a control's perspective, not, it, will, it is not seen to be uh, the problem of a control engineer to look into that. Up until you start looking at the literature on analysis of software. Okay? And when you look at the literature on analysis of software, uh, you see that some of the most uh, significant difficulties encountered by the people who were analyzing the code of aircraft such as the Airbus A380 were precisely second order systems, okay? second order filters such as the one you see here. And uh, why was, was that creating trouble for them? Well, because the trajectories followed by uh, this second order system would not fit their analysis framework at all. The analysis framework uh, for much of the uh, static analysis community is to say whenever I have two states, I am going to try and frame those states or the set of states that can be reached in a box, in a square box, okay? A square horizontal box, okay? And guess what happens? When you try and propagate that box through the dynamics of the system, sure, it shrinks a little bit because it's a stable system, but then when you try and fit it in a horizontal box, again, then that box is bigger than the original box. So even though the initial system was stable, the kind of approximate analysis designed by uh, tools such as abstract interpretation or frameworks such as abstract interpretation uh, make or draw the wrong conclusions, which is the filter is unstable. Okay? Or in fact, it doesn't draw the wrong conclusion. It just says, it is quite possible that your filter is unstable, even though it is stable. And so uh, looking closer at the trajectories, uh, simulated trajectories for that second order filter, they say, hmm, those trajectories, they look very much like ellipses. How about my trying uh, ellipses and ellipsoidal approximations of the reachable set as opposed to square boxes? Okay. And, um, and amazingly, of course, it worked. Okay. And, um, all in all, uh, Cuzo and his uh, co-workers single-handedly reinvented Lyapunov's stability theory for their own consumption, uh, which, um, which is kind of uh, surprising uh, in several regards, because uh, A, because Lyapunov's stability theory we know is more than 100 years old, but B, because they did not even bother, I mean, they, they basically found it easier to reinvent it all from scratch rather than read our literature, okay? Uh, which is, which is uh, 
I mean, which is a preoccupation for me, and also maybe an opportunity to say, hey, wait a minute here. The guys who designed the second order filter, whoever they were, they must have had this Lyapunov function hidden somewhere in their stuff. They just threw it to the wastebasket because, because, because Airbus didn't let them time to write the paper in the transaction automatic control. Okay, so that's where it went, to state by the, the wastebasket. And, uh, and then they just sent the code to the, to the people for analysis. Okay, and that's how the baby got thrown away with the bathwater. So let's see if, in fact, we can keep the baby and uh, put it through uh, the system uh, just like we put the code through. In other terms, can we try and do the following thing? Uh, instead of following the old uh, standard of uh, we write the controller specification, we painfully derive a proof, and then uh, we throw the specs in the autocoder, we forget about the proofs, we ended up with something that's autocoded that is then completely reanalyzed by these very smart people uh, at uh, certification time. Why don't we replace this by uh, a case where um, by uh, a case where the control specification and the proof are taken by some sort of credible controller? By that I mean a controller that uh, uh, an autocoder that takes uh, the, the proofs as well, and it automatically produces automatically documented code that because it is documented, becomes somewhat easier to verify at the end. Uh, so why do I call that a credible autocoder? It's because uh, Martin Reinhardt from MIT had written the concept of credible compiler. And, um, and I thought you know, that uh, what I was talking about was very close to what he was talking about, although I was uh, not talking about the same uh, transformation level. Uh, why not? Why talk about credible autocoder? There's something that produces code with proofs, as opposed to say, "Oh, I'm gonna my my tool, my uh, autocoder is so good, okay, that it's always gonna do a good job, okay. It's always gonna transform my specification into something that works as well as the specifications did." And the answer is, uh, uh, the answer is that the the the, the jump uh, to go from the specification to the code is still a little too high to prove that the tool itself will do the job always correctly. Uh, and that is uh, in contrast with compilers, uh, a specialist of which I'm not, uh, uh, where people say that provided you compile code such as C code, for example, uh, the source code is sufficiently close to the machine code that you can start writing uh, statements such as the compiler is certified. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's a slight difference between the two, uh, the two steps. And uh, so of course that leads us to say, okay, uh, so, so if you want to transform both your specifications and uh, their semantics into source code, uh, and if you want to translate also what the proof of the, uh, the semantics, if I may say, okay, uh, the proof that the system is stable, as well, then what you're, what you're really getting into is the business of defining what a proof is for a variety of different people. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's all nice. Uh, I mean, at least up until 10 years ago, you know, I felt I was a control systems guy who was able to read more or less all the transactions without any hesitation. Ever since, it has kind of uh, mollified. But, um, uh, but it's different if you now have to write this proof, not only for your own consumption, but also for the consumption of somebody else, okay, say a computer programmer, okay, or something else that is a computer. Okay, and you find yourself in the business of trying to say, okay, so how am I gonna translate this uh, transaction automatic control proof I've got into something that a computer can understand? And um, um, I mean, so on the downside, yes, it's challenging. On the upside, I think it is uh, a, a very interesting and very fruitful effort in uh, the game of certification. Why is that? It's because the game of certification is, in a way, a game of, of uh, gathering consensus around one particular concept and where everybody says, yes, I believe this concept works. Okay. And uh, so if you start like expressing that concept in the language of the different actors 
of the certification uh, of the object to be certified, then necessarily, at least uh, that's my hope, uh, you're going to be able to draw a larger consensus than if you say, like I've heard, oh, you know, all what matters is the specs, you know, I don't care about the code. Well, it turns out that half of the computer scientists love code. Okay, that's the only input they will take in their analyzers. Okay, they don't want to hear about anything else. Okay, so you can reject them, but they'll be coming back through the back door, don't worry. Uh, so, um, so that's how uh, we ended up working on a few things. Uh, so, uh, sure, I mean, the, the part, the, the part like, of the proof, which is expressed in natural language and uh, was written uh, 20 years ago in the uh, transactions, um, I mean, we all understand, uh, you know, that uh, the Apuna function, as long as it's quadratic, it's summarized by a particular two by two matrix and blah, blah, blah. Okay. We also understand. Okay. So I skip that part. Everybody understands that part. Okay. So, and then, um, uh, and then also everybody understands that in order to prove that a certain function is a Lyapunov really function, it must satisfy some properties. And that somehow some of these properties, uh, including the fact that it decays along any trajectory, can be a rather painful exercise, but which in the end we actually can uh, complete, okay? Now, try and explain that, try and explain the different steps uh, to establish that proof to a computer. How are you gonna do that? Okay, that was the first question. Well, um, there are several things, okay? Uh, first of all, well, all right, so the first thing is try and explain how to put this proof in the brain of an engineer, okay? That's already hard enough, okay? Remember, okay? Most of our aerospace engineers graduate before they get a master's. Okay, <laughs> uh, they usually stop at the at the bachelor's level. But we say that their, their master's dropouts. That's what they are. Okay, or their PhD dropouts. Okay, and so um, and so so you need to give them like a way to express these kind of things uh, in a in an easy way. So uh, I claim this is easy. Uh, why? Because it's, uh, it's simulink, okay, with the original controller shown in black here. And, uh, and uh, on top of that uh, black simulink uh, controller, there is also uh, some blue stuff, some red stuff, and some green stuff, okay. And uh, the blue stuff and the, the red stuff, it's basically the statement I want to say about the system, okay, which is for any input, okay, the... Uh, the states of the system are bounded. Okay, that's how all I'm interested. Why am I interested in that? Well, because it's never good to code uh, variables over the wrong number of bits. Okay, and so that's why uh, variable boundedness is so important in software verification. Um, so instead of uh, so so sometimes you need to to give a leg up to the system. Okay, you say, uh, yes, but you know, I mean, who knows that saturation is bounded above by one? Uh, so let me add maybe a little statement here to help. Uh, this uh, uh, to help the, the statement, okay? And then uh, let me add, the, so let me put this thing as a statement. Now it turns out that MATLAB has it, or it has the possibility of drawing some wire uh, that express like logical things as opposed to just like dynamical things. Uh, but uh, what, they, what MATLAB has is it has it in the form of something that's then coded and executed as a test and it asks, so is it true that uh, the states are inside the ellipsoid? And uh, as soon as it's not true anymore, blam, the code stops and says, I've got a problem here. Okay? So they call that observers. And um, uh, the, this is not the purpose that I was following. Okay? The purpose I'm following is instead to put that as a logical statement, which is a property of the system. Now, uh, as it turns out, uh, not only do we need to prove or to put in uh, the statements that we are interested in as far as our control system is concerned. Notice here we're just making statements about the open loop contr controller. Okay, I'll talk about the closed loop system later. But uh, we also need to prove, uh, or we also need to assist uh, the system with some elements of proof. Okay, why should we have spent all the time deriving a proof that indeed that ellipsoid is invariant? if we don't have a proof for it, or if we leave it up to the software verification system to reconstruct that proof, okay? So to the best possible extent, uh, we need to put elements of this proof, which in any case uh, look like uh, this tautology here. Uh, it's always true. 
uh, and it's very useful uh, in order to support uh, precisely the statement that I'm uh, looking for. So that would give us like the sort of uh, the sketch of a environment, a graphical environment where you could specify not only the system but also its semantics. Okay, and again, it's close to what MATLAB does. However, it's somehow maybe a step beyond. Like for example, here, really what this thing says is that for all x, x less than or equal to 1. I mean, for all x, x less than or equal to 1 uh, is not something that you can simulate. Okay? So really, you start looking and using the simulating diagram for the purpose it was not meant to do, okay? which is for doing formal analysis on it as opposed to simulation on it. Okay? And the matter gets only uh, and, 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 uh, but provided that you, f you follow my story and you believe that an engineer would be able to put in these kind of things in the simulating diagram, okay, so now you know, brand new kind of homework, instead of proof by hand, is like put in the diagram <laughs> your simulating thing uh, and your proof. Uh, then, then of course we, can, we need to think about uh, the next step which is explaining how these kind of behaviors or the kind of semantics of the system can be expressed at the level of the code itself. Why the code itself? Because as I said, half of the computer scientists will only read that stuff, nothing else. Okay? And then uh, one of the formats that we've looked at, because we don't work with very complicated code, we work with sequential codes. Uh, you know, in aerospace, uh, functions go away. Uh, uh, concurrent coding is like a, a, a big uh, no-no. Uh, I mean, there are lots of things that uh, that sort of vanish, uh, that are considered good programming practices anywhere but in aviation. Okay. So for that, uh, there is this marvelous little environment um, uh, developed by uh, uh, Floyd and Hoar in the 1960s, which says pretty much what we enjoy in controls, which, is, which looks at the code as a sequence of instructions and looks at where uh, the state could be before the instruction is executed and where the uh, state is going to be after the execution of the uh, instruction. So for example, uh, here, uh, before you had x belonging to some ellipsoid, y some variable less than 1, and then we put u is equal to cx plus dy, and we can conclude, uh, we can add this statement that u squared less than, you know, 2 times, well, anyway, cauchy schwarz blah, uh, uh, and y is still uh, less than 1. And uh, so what, uh, what you're doing is literally tracking through what the program does, what you can say about uh, the state space of your, of your uh, program. Okay? And uh, it's, it's excessively convenient because A, it fits completely with what uh, I understand it controls, and B, uh, it's considered to be uh, a good stuff in, uh, in computer science as well. So, uh, uh, so that's how we decided to uh, write things down here, except for one thing, which is uh, first, this is MATLAB, so we need to write it for C, and second, that this kind of comments here, uh, written between brackets, I mean, it's still a kind of gibberish. Okay, it's uh, it, it's uh, I wrote it. Okay, uh, it's not it's not readable by a computer program whatsoever. However, what you would want is eventually attain a common structure. Which is, uh, uh, which is clear enough in si a, com uh, a common syntax, which is clear enough that it can be parsed by a computer, okay? At the same time as it reads the lines of code themselves. So uh, I will skip this part and talk briefly about uh, uh, the implementation effort that comes with uh, the process that I have described to you uh, so far. Uh, there are two uh, efforts going on in parallel, a front end and a back end. And the front end is really the design oriented phase, whereby you write down your control system, say in Simulink, you stick in the proofs uh, that your system works fine, uh, stability uh, and uh, other performance kind of uh, properties. And then uh, you write this credible autocoder that sort of takes all this and produces a documented autocode. So instead of my gibberish language, uh, we use uh, uh, the NCC uh, specification language. Uh, it is a uh, language, uh, ACSA, it's a language that was designed at uh, the CEA, Centre d'Etudes Atomique in uh, Saclay, and um, can be used to comment formally C programs. 
Uh, and it can be parsed by uh, an analysis environment put together by the same team named Pharmacy. What that allows us to do is therefore write C programs together with the comments that can be analyzed by Pharmacy, or to be more precise, handled by Pharmacy and transformed into uh, what people call proof obligations that then can be uh, further analyzed by any mathematical uh, automated theorem uh, proving software. Uh, since there is none, it's uh, easy to say. I should say semi-automated uh, theorem proving software such as PVS. Uh, the, process, the process at the beginning started with Simulink and ended with a commented C code. But then uh, I have a surprise for Gare um, after that. Uh, but before that, um, so I just want to say that on the Simulink side, so the, the kind of semantics we write are uh, of the block diagram kind. Uh, we hesitated between drawing block diagrams or uh, writing sort of uh, uh, small uh, statements, opening like a mini MATLAB window. And I think that the block diagram is really the way to go if you want to get anybody to buy into it. On the C, on the, on the, on the C side, uh, so we wrote everything in SESL. Uh, as far as uh, the autocoding environment is concerned, uh, we started with uh, uh, Gini Auto, uh, which is uh, an environment uh, uh, developed by uh, Pantel, Dumagard, and uh, Toom. And uh, which precisely aims at doing some reasonably clean uh, autocoding. However, uh, on top of uh, Gini Auto, what we added was the possibility of adding statements, okay, logical statements about what the system does. And so uh, that transformed the autocoder from uh, certainly a nice autocoder, but a, a coder, an autocoder to, uh, that satisfied our requirement, that is a credible autocoder. Um, so, uh, you still have to wait for the surprise. Uh, yeah, and uh, so of course, in general, uh, people would not take our initiative very seriously if there was no way to at least show as a matter of concept that the work can indeed be then deciphered by an independent tool that takes whatever has been produced as C code and whatever has been put in as comments and verifies that everything is coherent. Okay, so although normally a back end should be probably developed independently from the front end, you know, you cannot be a criminal judge and party at the same time. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can certainly do it in the lab. I mean, in the lab, uh, I'm the dictator anyway. There is no uh, such thing as a just, uh, justice system. Uh, so, uh, in which case, um, so we, as I said, we used Pharmacy as the primary analysis environment that takes the computer program that was written and basically allows us to interface uh, whatever logical statements we have put together with the software into uh, a format that can be handled by uh, automated uh, proving software. Uh, it's not completely automated yet. What has happened is that PVS, which is sort of uh, one of the reference analysis systems, uh, theorem proving systems available on the market uh, these days. Uh, it has triggered like a whole bunch of reactions on their side uh, because PVS was mostly interested with sort of discrete properties of systems uh, and, and discrete kind of uh, math. Uh, when we bombarded them with our control system, they said, oh, but we don't have any li uh, uh, linear algebra uh, library uh, in, our, in our system yet. So they started like coding that in and uh, and, um, and uh, it's sort of slowly catching up, okay? Um, so I will, um, uh, I, I will skip this slide and just talk a little bit about a physical example, and that's why it gets fun, okay? Which is that uh, we implemented this thing on a small three degree of freedom helicopter uh, designed at MIT and manufactured by some random Canadian company. And uh, what you saw is that that was the first attempt at our doing our job. There's, we have a representation of the, the code, okay, uh, of the controller that implements this thing, including, of course, everything that was hidden carefully by Quanzer, but we found nevertheless, including like some first order filters and things that were hidden under, swept under the carpet, okay. And we basically wanted to do the following exercise. Let us design 
a controller that does the same thing as the original controller, but on top of that, it comes with proofs. Okay, and we manage that without screwing up the plant. So, you know, <laughs> in other terms, we are able to put our comments without screwing up uh, the system. Uh, I mean, it may sound like totally dumb, but uh, you know, at the beginning, you always have like this little anxiety, like, what have I managed to screw up by putting all these stupid proofs into that thing that was supposed to work? Okay. And uh, so anyway, uh, so there it is, okay. The code that is in there has been compiled uh, despite the fact that it had all these comments into it. And despite all these comments, it still does what, uh, what uh, anybody involved in a controls lab at the undergraduate level uh, knows, okay? All right, so uh, I will skip that and move on to the next uh, application, okay, which is um, an F-18 replica that was uh, flown by Rockwell Collins uh, a few years ago for the purpose of showing the benefits of uh, adaptive control when you lose a wing, okay? And so we, we, we saw the same kind of stuff and, uh, and a student went there. And, uh, and so he started like, you know, deriving his invariant ellipsoids and everything uh, and, uh, you know, in Simulink and then translating them via the credible autocoder into C code. All that worked fine, okay, except A, they did not let us fly the machine, okay, uh, because it had been flown only, uh, 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 for, I mean, had not been flown for a few years. It was, it was sort of a shelved item, not, not something operational yet. And second, then they asked us, yeah, but those ellipsoids, can't you come up with them automatically? I said, oh, no, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, it took me 20 years to get out of the LMI business. It's not to bring it back. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that's what they wanted. So I said, sure, we'll do it. Okay, and, uh, and um, ever since I called uh, Sasha Magretsky and Gary Ballas like mad, saying, okay, can I unearth your old stuff? Because it seems that there is renewed interest in it. Okay, and the idea is, of course, to, uh, to sort of generate the certificates automatically, whether they're robustness certificates or, but, and, and, and then take the certificates, put them automatically in the simulating diagram for people to watch, okay, and then translate them automatically down to the code, okay, so that the computer scientists, who uh, I may uh, remind you are about 10 to 20 times uh, our size, okay, uh, can look at it and, um, and uh, get an impression. So um, I will skip uh, some of these details for the stability proof for the F-18. Uh, we didn't work with the adaptive controller. We worked with uh, just uh, the linear control baseline of the F-18. But it still had like about 30 modes and stuff like that. It had like fairly big state space. So, uh, so the students spent a, a good chunk of the summer just coming up with all the certificates that uh, Rockwell Collins wanted. Uh, I skip the details. I want to uh, briefly talk about uh, another application where the same philosophy as the one that I've expressed to you so far is uh, quite, will quite possibly work. Uh, I mean, if I were to summarize uh, the work so far, I would say the following. So what we have is people who are really good at one particular field, say controls, okay? They know tons of proofs. And the only contribution is say, don't throw the proof away, but bring it down to the code level so that the people, so that in short, the computer science community can share the, uh, can, can have access to that proof and manipulate it to its own uh, desires. Uh, well, the same is true for uh, other applications, uh, which are more, I mean, less like sort of inner loop control, more outer loop control. Uh, and among these applications, none is uh, more important than collision avoidance. I hope you will agree with me. So uh, the collision avoidance system currently uh, in use all over the planet is uh, such that if you are within one minute of a possible collision, okay, the system screens at the pilot what to do in order for the pilot to avoid the collision. We know so it doesn't work all the time, but it provides uh, nevertheless all in all uh, pretty good benefits. The system has been introduced in around 1990, has been working fine until now. Uh, but now the system begins to hurt again. Why is that? Well, the system was designed uh, the following way. The code was written and then the specifications were written. Okay. Uh, in other terms, uh, I mean, you could say uh, in short uh, that uh, there was a little bit of a hack involved. And um, um, 
And the result is that you end up having something that's, well, that, that's complete, that works, okay, but that took enormous amount of effort to uh, get to where it is, and which is extremely difficult to change. However, we've got big changes coming on the horizon, okay? So first of all, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, everybody has heard about uh, the desperate efforts by the entire aerospace community to get uh, these vehicles up in the sky and the FAA pushing back as far as, as, as much as he can, saying, no, we cannot have them, okay? And of course we cannot, okay? The TCAS system that avoids collision between aircraft and aircraft is not meant to avoid collision between UAV and aircraft. For one thing, a 737 is probably closer to a 747 in terms of dynamics than it is to a uh, whatever thing we fly, uh, you know, predator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, so uh, that certainly urged people to go and say we need something more flexible. We cannot write a program or we cannot write like specs directly uh, in this case. And guess what uh, came up? Dynamic programming. Okay, uh, somebody named uh, uh, Michael Kuschendorfer at uh, Lincoln Lab uh, said, hey, you know, I could write this problem of collision avoidance as a dynamic program. And then uh, I, can, I have tons of methods to solve this dynamic program, value iteration, police iteration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, I can basically turn the crank uh, as often as you want. I can turn the crank for an aircraft, I can turn uh, for an aircraft pair, I can turn the crank for an aircraft and a UAV, I can turn the crank for a pair of UAVs. It's not, you know, in the end, it's all going to look like a big lookup table, and the lookup table being the optimal value function. So uh, the FAA uh, and uh, his, uh, the person responsible for TCAS, Neil Suki, uh, uh, very much encouraged that because he saw very quickly the huge benefits that this system could bring. Uh, to the uh, uh, airborne community and what kind of an enabler it could be for unmanned aerial vehicles uh, in the national airspace. And uh, so it is currently uh, discussed all over the world. There is, uh, they, are like, they have like uh, uh, workshops every month. Uh, the next one will be at uh, Georgia Tech. And, and of course it will need to be certified. Okay? And that's where of course, the uh, message that I've sent so far comes back. Well, if the system was indeed designed using dynamic programming, okay, there's not much of a difference between a value function and a Lyapunov function. For one thing, the two of them better decrease along any trajectory, at least uh, along the nominal trajectory. Okay? So therefore, I can anticipate that value functions are going to be as good a source of information about how the system will behave as uh, the Lyapunov functions I talked about earlier. And so uh, that leads to, uh, uh, of course, so that leads to uh, a possible answer or a possible innovative answer to the problem of certifying uh, ACAS-X. Um, and it seems also that it will answer some of the questions that uh, the Lincoln Lab uh, people have about their very same system because they were, they're concerned about the certification of the system. Uh, uh, the certification so far has been done using a gazillion simulations. Okay, Their hope is that they can use something a little bit more formal this time. So, uh, so since J, uh, the optimum cost, acts as a Lyapunov function, then let's see what we can do with it. So that's a regular Lyapunov function. Okay. Uh, where the uh, innermost ellipsoid is, in, uh, is invariant. Uh, well, that's more like the kind of Lyapunov function you encounter when you solve dynamic programs. Okay? Uh, the, contour <laughs> the contour of the optimal value function uh, are not very easily seen here. I see, you, see, you see a little bit here? I mean, they're kind of crooked. Okay? Uh, let, me, let me draw them. Okay? So that would be like a contour here, it does that, then it does this, it escapes, okay? And then it comes back here, and then it does that, it does that, it does that. So this is anything but ellipsoidal, okay? And, uh, but nevertheless, it's very interesting. It tells you a lot about, for example, anywhere you start from, okay? Anywhere you start from, where you cannot end up, okay? Because you, if you start inside the level set of one of these uh, value functions, then you're gonna stay inside that level set. And so, uh, and so uh, I think there is a lot of potential uh, towards uh, bringing uh, 
uh, the kind of concepts and ideas that were thought about at the design space for uh, this, uh, um, uh, for this uh, dynamic program, okay, either for a path planning activity here or a collision avoidance activity, as I've discussed a little bit later and shown here as a uh, cartoon. Okay? So, of course, there are challenges too, uh, because you design your system not the same way you analyze them. You design them like quick and dirty, and you analyze them like clean and very long. Okay? So, uh, in the meantime, of course, the value function that was used for design may need a little bit of refinement in order to be truly a certificate that can be used to establish, run, uh, 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 for example, the absence of runtime error in the uh, corresponding embedded software. Uh, but modulo that, I think it's possible, and so that's why I'm looking at it. Therefore, uh, let me conclude here and uh, repeat that uh, I believe it's possible to generate a safety critical control code from specification or equipped with semantics and proofs from what uh, we know uh, from our theoretical field. And that m modulo that, code level analysis are made much easier uh, than uh, analysis that come from uh, undocumented code alone. Thank you. No, no, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll move, yeah go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, or, or, or maybe sometimes there's this view that even the specification different communities want to treat problems different ways. Mm -hmm. um, like you mentioned that, you know, or maybe it's that the computer science majors want to go with the colleagues that want to reproduce the same standard, et cetera. Do you think that there's more that we need to do as a control community to actually be disseminating what we're producing to other communities, or is that a role that other fields have to work harder to then understand what we're doing, or, or what's that? So I, I think that, uh, you know, like having just a seam won't, won't work, so we need overlap. And, uh, and then uh, again, uh, I didn't mean to say anything bad about the computer science community. Uh, I mean, reinventing Lyapunov stability theory on the fly because they needed it was kind of something fun, I think, to read. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, but, but that being said, so I think that the, the efforts come with uh, sort of stretching our students a little bit beyond maybe uh, telling them a few of these lessons um, uh, in such a way that they understand that in a way uh, what people in computer science expect when it comes to proving software is not that different from what we produce. Uh, but nevertheless, it appears in a different format. So I think that it goes with, uh, again, uh, informing the students and also, uh, and also producing the tools that sort of uh, provide the proper overlap. Yes. So um, in the second part of your talk, you mentioned this uh, dynamic program-based solution where right. you compute the value function in the abstract and reuse it. I was a little bit confused because the value function depends on the environment. So Absolutely. Do you have like a specific environment in mind you want to use? Uh, yes, none. For, uh, for uh, in the case of aircraft, none. There is air and two aircraft. So it's very clean. Okay. It's a very clean thing. So you can, you can actually store the entire value function. now. For each aircraft pair, you're going to have to store a different value function in principle. Because of the different computing space? Yes, because the dynamics get different. Okay. So, but, but, uh, and, and that's what they're doing. And, and of course, justifiably, uh, there is an interesting underlying model reduction problem there, which is, so how many categories of aircraft do I need to do? Because for each one, I'm going to have like one particular lookup table. Yes, Sayan? Mm -hmm. to your model. Uh, it can be a proof or it can be some information. Which some knowledge, yeah. And the second part is actually using those annotations mm -hmm. to do the analysis. So then my question is, uh, you mentioned a couple of examples of annotations, the Apunov function that I was showing. Do you have other types of annotations in mind? And how hard do you think is the second part, which is going from annotations to actually uh, producing guarantees that sort of so, yeah, so annotations with, uh, annotations with singular points here and things like that. Okay. Uh, that's what I have in mind eventually. 
uh, where, where the object is very, has been synthesized with the help of a computer. And uh, I mean, the semantics, I mean, this is really the, those, the level sets, they are really the semantics of the system. And they are by no means uh, easy to parameterize. Uh, you know, if you, I mean, you can look at this toy. You can also look at uh, much less toyish examples that uh, Claire Tomlin uh, was uh, showing at some point. I mean, those those level sets really have shapes that are not easy to parameterize. Nevertheless, what they encode the semantics of your system, and you want those to be part to to be there. Okay. So, so, so it, it makes for it makes for much more complex objects than just ellipses. Right. So the second part of my question was: Okay, once you have these annotations, do you see that some standard uh, static analysis technique would just do the analysis, or even there, there is need for uh, new innovation? Uh, so, so far, uh, there are. Uh, I work with two people: uh, Arno Venet at NASA on the one hand, and then uh, and then um, uh, another group on the other hand in Toulouse. And um, uh, Arnaud, Arnaud claims that it's, it's not going to be that big an effort for him to adapt whatever he's got in terms of abstract interpretation to uh, this. He says he, he can read ACSL. Of course, he needs to make, uh, to put in the effort, but uh, you know, to, to be able to parse the language. But then uh, he doesn't see too big a difficulty. And then, of course, there is the fact that we're also building a, building an actual one <laughs> with another team. And, and uh, it's a big mess. I mean, sort of, you know, getting uh, getting all these all these experimental software to talk to each other, like why PVS uh, uh, and uh, pharmacies uh, is a sort of a daunting task. Hey. Yes. Um, and when you go from simulating to patch them like this, you never know what you're designing. Can you comment a little bit on that? So that's why I, that's why I call the system like what I call a credible autocoder. Uh -huh. So because the manipulations are done in a sort of uh, ad hoc way, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, you know there are chances that what you're going to get in the end, um, you know the proof will not work anymore yeah, <laughs> at the end. Patching. So, so, so your your hope is that uh, as you go through successive transformation, will not you, you will not drift too far, yeah. and that the proof will still work. And if it doesn't work, then you have to re <laughs> you have to rework the proof at the end. Of course, th the hope is not that uh, is not for that to happen, but rather for saying, okay, well, what you got in the end is in fact quite different from what you had at the beginning. But nevertheless, that property still holds. That key property still holds. When is the last time MATLAB made a workshop uh, uh, at your place? Huh? Did they do it? At Illinois. They must, they must have like a MATLAB lectures, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, so that's the reason, you know. <laughs> Personally, I, 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 I use both MATLAB and, um, and Scilab, uh, the free MATLAB, so that I don't feel I'm too much uh, too much of a prisoner of one manufacturer, but that's the problem. You know, it's, uh, all our students end up knowing MATLAB, and that's it. I mean, it's used in the courses, right? It's used in the courses, exactly. You know, it's sort of a, it's no, the de facto MATLAB standard. MATLAB is one thing that I think is, uh, is very disturbing, I think, mm -hmm. because I mean, I can't connect it between our systems and everything. Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, no, it's it's uh, it's a problem, but I think that uh, well. You know, one way of looking at what we're doing is trying to make Simulink evolve a little bit towards including a little bit more semantics than it does now, uh, and basically making it slightly better posed than it is now. <laughs> but but it, it, it's an effort, and 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 it's not. I think it's not a surprise that uh, the de facto standard in aerospace industry, um, when it comes to uh, designing the avionics, so when you get down to the to the beast itself. Is a SCADE. SCADE is much more uh, is a much more solid environment. Nevertheless, they did a simulating interface for it. It's all simulated. Yes, <laughs> it's a it's a very successful product. Maybe one last question. So, uh, if that is your proof, the same as the proof that we Correct. It won't prevent the case that I design a perfect controller, but when they implement it, there are like numerical errors. 
So yes and no, because uh, the elements of the proof, for example, will contain, in particular, information about the size of the variables. So it may, in, it may talk about the size of the variables that are at the spec level, you know, the x in ax, uh, in ax plus b equals x dot. But it will contain that information. And, um, and when time comes to choose like uh, the bit size of, uh, of uh, the variables, uh, you know, if you combine, if you, a good analyzer that combines the information it gets from the top with, uh, for example, uh, knowledge about how many bits uh, the variables are coded down, should be able to detect automatically that something is not consistent. What, what it will not pro uh, uh, protect you against is the unknown unknowns. Okay, well let's thank uh, Professor Perron. Uh, we have a small gift for you. Uh, it's a wireless uh, presenter. Well, oh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate that. So while we uh, switch speakers, I'll uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Fred Hader is uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab's Associate Chief Sci uh, Technologist. He joined JPL in 1984 after getting his PhD from the University of Southern California. Um, he's been at uh, JPL now for uh, oh, you know, going on three decades, and he's helped with a variety of uh, NASA missions such as uh, Mars Pathfinder, Mars Exploration Rover, uh, the Cassini mission to Saturn, the Space Telescope Spitzer, and the Mars Science Lab for the delivery of Curiosity, uh, among many other missions. Um, and um, he is a fellow of the IEEE and the AIAA, um, and he's received uh, numerous awards for his research and work at NASA. And today he will be talking about uh, state of the art in formation flying and distributed spacecraft systems. And I'll switch the mic over to him. Okay, yeah, it's just behind you. like to have the pointer. Uh, let's see if I can have one right here. And this one works, I think. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, the, uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, state of the art in distributed systems. Every time that uh, you want to assess the state of the art or, or uh, give an overview of what people have done, you're going to leave some people out, and you're going to leave some, uh, some mission unmentioned, and I always get into trouble when I do that. So, um, so I do like to acknowledge everyone who I have not mentioned, or every agency that I will not mention, and all the missions that I will refer to that, that, that it may also uh, come acknowledged. Um, what I want to do is to uh, give you a motivation why at least uh, in, in NASA, Jet Propulsion Laboratory specifically, was behind uh, going from very large monolithic systems to, to distributed systems and what is today known as formation flying. Um, also give you uh, a feeling what, what is being done today in the U.S. and also uh, what's being done in the rest of the world uh, in the area of formation flying and in general in the distributed spacecraft area. 
And then I would penetrate in what JPL, what we're doing at JPL today, and some of the missions that we're working on, what our objective science objectives are, and, and the collaborations that we have with the rest of the world, and then some areas of, of research that in the past uh, three to four years, maybe five years, we, we initiated um, jointly with the Department of Defense, uh, what is now known as the Swans of the Spacecraft, that, that the idea is to, to fly tens of thousands of very tiny spacecraft as opposed to a few uh, highly capable. And that really is where, in my view, uh, some of the real uh, technological challenges are going to be showing. And, and I think that uh, because of the values, because of the capabilities, because of the enabling nature of that, uh, of, uh, of swarms, I think that there's going to be a, a tremendous uh, attention and investment in that area over the next few years. Uh, to start with, um, we, uh, where we got our, uh, how we've been inspired is really been by nature. That why, why do we want to do collective things as opposed to one in individual giant capable things? And this is a video that, that I don't uh, take you through it. It's about 15 minutes or so. But so if you can notice that there's this uh, lizard right here and this, uh, this ant, and in about, um, uh, ten minutes later, you see all these uh, hundreds of other ants that are attacking in the lizard, and, and what I call it at the very end task completion, 15 minutes later, that's what's left of it. And, and the message is that uh, the task of, of, of getting to this stage could never be done by this individual. And um, I, I showed this to a DARPA program manager friend, and he says that, that really I can say that this is somebody who discovered a BAA, Broad Agency Announcement Opportunity for Funds. <laughs> and, and, and this is what happened as soon as we announced it. And this is what happened after the announcement, but there's still some non-believers that are hanging in there <laughs> to get more funds. So you can apply this example for a variety of applications. Um, but, but the real uh, story behind uh, why I started some, some two decades ago, the work that is going on in formation flying at JPL, um, ironically, was because of our frustration of working with, with missions like this. This is about a time and a half or twice the size of a football field. It's a mission called a Space Interferometer. We spent over $800 million to build the technology and actually do this essentially for, uh, for planet detection as a response to the NASA general theme, are we alone in the universe? And, and so the idea is that if you think about the Hubble telescope today, the aperture of Hubble telescope is about two and a half meters. And if you think about the largest telescope that mankind will build and is building in space, it's the NGST, Next Generation Space Telescope, supposed to fly in about two to three years. I think it's about $4 billion uh, over budgeted. And, and that would be six and a half meters. So if you also think about being in a geosynchronous orbit and you want to achieve a resolution of a couple of centimeters, this is 40,000 kilometers or so, you need about an aperture which is about 200, mi 200, 200 meters. So, so you can imagine, therefore, uh, a lens of a 200 meters or a mirror of a 200 meters uh, length. Um, and then if you're looking at, to, looking at distance stars of 100 light years away, and you're trying to understand and answer the question, are we alone? And you're looking for exoplanets that have the same characteristics as Earth. So you can imagine that the, the traditional approach is not going to take you there. And then a single lens is not going to take you there. And that was the motivation of SIM. So the Space Interferometer mission was placing these telescopes where they are. And then we needed to we provide the extreme accuracy from the control structure and control point of view. And those of us who were doing the controls research going back to mid-1980s and early 1990s, there was a field called CSI, Control Structure Interaction, to optimize their structures and control systems simultaneously to achieve the performance that was needed. Of course, for SIM, we actually need to do picometer metrology. And, and, then, and then, obviously, you needed to actually have an extreme alignment to a fraction of a wavelength, because you're looking at the same light source, you need to bring it in to integrate it. 
And, and that, you, you can imagine the control system on that is extraordinarily complex. So typically a large flexible structures, we have all these multi-body dynamic interactions, we've got all these non-linearities, you've got all these uh, issues with the precision, non-co-locations of the sensor and actors, all the stuff that we've learned in classical control, it actually shows up. A modeling that needs to be end-to-end -end system that brings in all this stuff that you knew to model, stuff you didn't know how to model, and, and have an end-to-end -end performance validation. So that was completely and, and amazingly uh, difficult to do, and I was leading that effort for my group. I actually started to look into uh, a, a, a diversion from large flexible structure control to look into distributed control. And my bet was that it would be easier to fly these telescopes by themselves and, and actually change and face the challenge of controlling these telescopes to the level of accuracy that was needed for these dynamical systems. And, and in a benign environment, like to be one astronomical unit being on a earthly part orbit where we actually position the telescope to, to make him operate. And plus, we would have the advantage that we will achieve significant aperture. Now remember these telescopes, you're synthesizing large apertures because you're doing, you have the separation of the baselines, but when you fly them, nothing stops you from having the uh, actual effective aperture, which is the separation of the bore side of the telescopes, to stop you. You can go as large as you want. You can synthesize a telescope which is five kilometers in terms of the lens power. So having said that, we started that research uh, going back to almost 20, 15, 20 years ago, and the idea was whether or not we could replace the large flexible structures with the small systems. And, and one more time today, we can see now everyone is now beating the drum of, uh, of uh, rigid body spacecraft, very tiny spacecraft, um, and, and people, are, you know, every university now these days have that CubeSat program. And the idea is to really get away from the large instruments and get into smart, use the technology, and, and, uh, and uh, go after uh, maybe distributed system that achieve or go beyond the capability of one. So having said that, this is also the picture of the laboratory that we use to validate some of the control systems uh, that, that this is about um, 100 feet. And, and, and some people are actually walking here that you don't see. Uh, we now are getting away from this type of thing, and I'll show you what our now labs are for uh, performance flying, uh, much, much more manageable and easier to work with, different type of problems and different type of technology needs. And, and this particular one, optical path length control, was at the core of, uh, core of the um, uh, enabling science that it needed to be on board of these uh, larger structures, with, of, of course, um, active vibrations or pressure, these things are not needed anymore if you want to do the same type of science, but you want to do it by formation flying. Okay, well, uh, going to our solar system, JPL, of course, has visited almost all of these, and we're just on the way on the one that we disqualified as a planet, Pluto. So that's going to be uh, probably the last one that, uh, that uh, is going to be major JPL mission. Uh, of course, uh, there is no, uh, no reason to second guess the vastness of our, our Milky Way and how big and the number of the stars, 300 billion stars. And if we go back to the question, are we alone? If I was to bet my, uh, my money, having 300 billion stars and all these planets that runs around them, the answer is very likely not. And, and then the question is, how do we actually uh, show it? How do we... What, what can we do about understanding of exoplanets? So the first exoplanets that it was detected, um, uh, it was five times bigger than the size of the Jupiter. And, 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 and orbits its star about 1,700 years. And as of about, uh, and actually this is the Hubble telescope that the first picture of an exoplanet that you actually got the images done was taken by, by Hubble. Um, we had, as of, uh, uh, the terrestrial planet finder was the very serious and most, complete, most complex design that it was essentially addressed to, to go way beyond the, the capability of a, any uh, 
designable telescope on Earth. And, and really capability that essentially would give opportunity to infinite baseline between the telescopes and have an integrator that brings the images or it would bring in the optical beams to integrate to learn about the knowledge of the atmosphere or, or the making of the atmosphere of an exoplanet. The understanding how uh, the imaging of an exoplanet is done and the way that TPF was going to be doing that is really looking at this, uh, this basic equation, that Zernick formula, that you have the, the intensity function, which is described as a function of a, a measurable function called coherence function. This is nothing except the two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform of this function. Telescope can actually measure this. And the formation plane, what it does is it takes the Cartesian plane and maps it to the UV optical plane. So essentially what you're doing is that by physically moving and separating the distance between each telescope, rotating about the bore side of each telescope, and then physically moving, what you would do is that you would go grid by grid in the optical plane and mapping the image of what you want to do of a light source. Now, like everyone else, we're also using MATLAB. So this is a simulation of a MATLAB, but it takes uh, a, a, a little time to essentially my process being able So as you know that a TPF orbit is um, heliocentric orbit, so about one astronomical unit of the size of Earth. And, um, and therefore, the communication between the spacecraft would go with time delay. So therefore, everything that needs to be done for that distributed system needs to be done onboard and autonomously. So all the issues and discussions about autonomous control and autonomous collision avoidance is a very relevant issue for us. And we cannot actually have collisions because this is a $3 billion mission. And, and worse than that, typically, this is a life opportunity for, for scientists that they get to, in a lifetime, to get to do the science they want. By colliding and losing the mission, that means that scientists who probably started this career when it was, this mission was being defied will no longer have the opportunity to conduct that research. So we really are, cannot afford failure. That's, that's a big thing. Earth orbiters, they do a different type of things. So this is a situation that we had the five telescope and one integrator. So you've got different inertial frame um, uh, simulation. This is the supervisory control. And that's the UV plane that I was mentioning to you. By physically moving, rotating about somewhere here, the center of formation, and each of these telescopes rotating about the both side, meanwhile moving, you essentially are moving from one grid point to another grid point on this UV plane. And each time that you do that, we call that a stop and a steer. You would have one more a quality image added to, to the images that you have come to. So it's not that you're taking a picture of a nose and an eye and a hair and you bring it together, you keep taking more and more and more info about something you don't know, and then you add to it as you actually map the UV plane. It turns out that if you would do, just like the way you compute the Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform in the same way, you only can go to finite number, and after that, you really don't add any value-added information. With this particular simulation, what we did was that we took a binary star which we had it in our banks, and we actually did the inverse processing and see whether or not the formation flying, the way we're doing that, can actually identify the binary stars. And then we noticed that after 25 points in this grid point, we no longer are seeing anything uh, beyond the quality of what we have done. So the star was already observed by some telescope, and we had it in our data banks. And then we, we essentially did the inverse processing, and then finally, we'd get to something that would, would, would come in as, as a binary star. OK, well, formation of fine has other science application. I want to mention to you that when I talk about uh, the assessment of the formation of fine, I mean non-classified formation of fine. So everything that you see here, and, and part of what you will see that I have taken out is all the stuff that open literature, NASA, 
uh, other, other agencies are doing. There are other activities are going, which is not part of theirs. But I can tell you it's not too much, more than what you see. So perhaps one interesting one is the A train that brings six spacecraft together. That's, as, as we talked, it's flying. And it gets it to a point that within 15 seconds of each other, they all would get an opportunity to look at same area of the target on Earth. But they each have instruments that they were supposed to fly and measure certain science. And then all of a sudden, you get an opportunity to bring all different things that they come together at the same time from one location. For example, one would bring you the temperature. The other one brings you the humidity. The other one brings you a various clouding con condition. One brings the seismic, all that integrated. At the same time, at some, t some particular time, taking TI. And now it gives you a new capability to understand how you could actually penetrate the, the, the dimension of the science. So it gives you co-observation capability. We also have the sensor web that gives you special sampling for variations, relative spacecraft motion as a sensor is graced. We have been flying this thing for about now 10, 12 years. And the whole science is that how you actually get the uh, relative distances between this spacecraft and this spacecraft change due to, uh, to the field effect. And the um, other example of LISA, I would talk about this more European mission, and we have some payload on that, which each spacecraft is about 500 million kilometers separated. And the idea is to measure the field uh, in, in where it is. One special project that I will concentrate on is going to be this, which is for large aperture. And there were some discussions about building distributed imaging. That's a, a DOD project, and I'll show you how, how far we've gone into the capability. The bottom line is this. From the two spacecraft mission that is uh, essentially demonstrate to a spacecraft the smallest number of for mission flying mission, for, a cap for capturing a, a small target in a space, typically used for sample return mission, we actually have teamed up with French to, to send up maybe a canister as big as a football that you have from the surface of Mars to the orbit of Mars and send in a spacecraft to go and grab it and bring it back. So this rendezvous, clearly you cannot use GPS when it comes to the position determination. And, and, and therefore, you need to have their own special hardware and, uh, and algorithms to work. So from this, which is the simplest, to more complex one that we're doing for recapturing a lost spacecraft in space, all required a special control, a special hardware, and a special software as I will take you through it. And bottom line is the formation is not only for life detection anymore. It's for significant earth science and, and defense applications now. The US had all these missions to the right of today want to be done by now. So you can see that, unfortunately, as the issue with the budget keeps, uh, keeps coming up, one administration to another administration is not really putting the money into some key science missions. And everything is moving to the right. Now, some of these, I come back to it, because they have some very key technological issues that I'd like to discuss with you. On the other hand, the non-US, which the European mission, is you can see that the whole space is being populated. And you can see, for example, CANAS. ESAM has successfully been, been demonstrating the four uh, radars, synthetic aperture radars, SARS, uh, since uh, December of 2005, or this, this 2004. Uh, I believe that the actual mission went to 2005. By the way, it sound translates into swarm. Oh, yes, yes, swarm. it's a swarm, right, right. And the next generation, in fact, they have a mission called swarm, just called oh, swarm. Oh, they call it swarm. Yes. They decided that international language would be better than... Just, just called. <laughs> Are you, are, you, are you joking or are you serious about it? But I do but, have, no, it's not, it's, it's but it is, it is called a swarm. Now, I do have, uh, in fact, a slide on that one. But ISM is actually flying. And while you, they're using synthetic capture radar, the real application of what they're doing is actually non-scientific. And, and, and French have been very good about not disclosing that. So we really don't know much about what's going on. Um, <clears throat> These represent some uh, key uh, 
missions that, in my view, have really changed the game. Uh, uh, going back to 1997, it started with the Japanese at the time called NASA, now they're called JAXA. It was the very first autonomous rendezvous and docking that used state-of-the-art technology at the time and, and demonstrated the docking, bringing two spacecraft completely autonomously. And, and remember this capability, we did that with Orbital Express just five, six years ago. DARPA did that. Um, Japanese did it in 1997. Um, I would give a lot of credit to Kones for, for flying ESAM because not only they flew the SAR, but they actually flew key technology components that establishes communication between these and control. While the real mission, if you want to have distributed SAR, you don't need to have collaborative systems. But they do have, and they actually adjust the distances very nicely. So DLR, now recently you can see that we have ESA, and then we have every space agency in Europe. We have CANES, we have the German DLR, we have the Swedish, we have the Italian. Each of them now are in the game of distributed networks in space. And each of them now, they'll have experiments going on. DLR recently demonstrated through TandemX, and, and NASA is going to be using TandemX for a very large array on, on the radars, that you, you can use GPS and use it very precise in coordination and control in, in LEO to MEO, although this was the LEO in low Earth orbit. Um, Prisma is actually the first one that has demonstrated optical and RF direct methodology for closed loop control. And that's what I would refer to as a formation control. And of course, ESA, you have the LISA Pathfinder. We have a, uh, a technology on this called DRS. That's Disturbance Rejection System that is, is, is co-located with a high precision instrument system to take the to noise and the vibration out. This is a major mission. And of course, um, a Pathfinder to, to LISA itself. Again, notice the distance between these three spacecraft are about uh, five million kilometers apart. And, and it's amazing how precise we can control these, and this is a real mission. And there are other ESA developments that we just don't get time to go through it. Um, coming back to formation, fine for us in astrophysics, we have been, NASA has been really extensively putting their, uh, their monies into this. If you, if you look at this mission, it has 32 spacecraft that, uh, that it has all the, all the formation control and all the distributed control that, that you want to do. The alignment and the control of these are in millimeter and better control. So uh, the, the type of actuation system you need to use need to be the type that will not contaminate the optics, which is bare optics. So you can see the issue for formation has its own technological issues that comes forward. Now this one, I was the PI on this one. This is a um, AFRL spacecraft, and, and this was our payload, and, and we needed to, to find this autonomously without the use of GPS on low Earth orbit, and go do the uh, football orbits around that, and get to maybe 10 meters, that's where DOD would allow you to get as close. And take some pictures, and, and maneuver again back, and come back and see if you can re re receive. Now, on the follow-up missions, we had a grappling system that could actually go and grapple the spacecraft. And the issue from control point of view was whether or not you had onboard reconfigurable control system that could actually deal with the new mass and new inertial system that can move it to another orbit. So technologically, very, very interesting and, and, and challenging. I think the next one would be uh, F6 that has been going now uh, in design for the past six years, that's a DARPA mission, and all the Fs stands for these. The bottom line is that you want to really break a big monolithic system into a smaller pieces that can work together. Now think about it. When I remember when I was talking to Owen Brown, the original project manager for F6, Owen was thinking practically, and it says that we need to send that to control system, navigation system, data handling system, communication system, 
or variations of that independently and let these guys come together and communicate wirelessly and, and build a, what he called a virtual spacecraft. Now, I think that at least 80% um, of what he said could be done um, because, you know, all the pointing requirements. But look about it, what now this is becoming. It's now possible that you're using, first of all, by having these distributed components of the same system, now they're developing a dis massively distributed computing capability on, in, in a spacecraft, in, in a space. They also are looking at uh, charging up various, so if you have a dead battery here, they use optical, um, optical energy to charge up a, a system that has failed because there is, there is a, the power system is dead or there's a failure there. It also comes in for servicing. You can actually go and take a board out and put it back. That technology has already been demonstrated. So the distributed network in space just goes way beyond that we're not happy with uh, infinite dimensional systems or, or large monolithic system. It becomes completely different capabilities. You have different part of the spacecraft that are in Earth orbit, and now you can come together and have a, a secondary launch vehicle and then launch a new inst an instrument. Or you have universal adapters here that can all of a sudden some RF antennas that are distributed can become and put an optical head and become optical telescope. So there are a lot of different exercises like this that is going on, which in my view are extremely uh, creative and game changing. That is a real play that is going on in space. So I did mention most of these, this fractionation is now becoming a theme that we're picking that up uh, from the NASA perspective. And, um, and it gives us a lot of robustness and fault tolerance um, that we really would like to build to our future systems. Okay, well, if we break down distributed spacecraft in a space into three categories, constellation, and what I would call knowledge formations, like these guys, and, and formations which requires inter-spacecraft sensing and communication. This is a coupling, in my view, just the same way that in 1980s and early 1990s, we're trying to optimize a structure dynamics and control system to build what we would call an optimal system. The, the connectivity between control comes through communication. I think that these two are going to hand in hand. Yeah, you can increase the performance and robustness through control and communication with these stupid networks if we concentrate in optimizing both of them at the same time. Now, having said this, formation flying, which therefore requires direct sensing and communication, these guys don't, has its own technology requirements and needs. And, and in each of these areas, I think that some areas were to TRL, technology readiness level of five and six, and, but in a lot of areas with two out of one, two, that we, we haven't been able to mature the theory and, and the methods that is needed to actually fly these things. For example, in Gaddison control, Gaddison estimation control, remember if you are in, in uh, deep space, the precision and where you are on that orbit is non-issue. More importantly, you cannot know uh, if you are in a spacecraft that is in a heliosynchronous orbit using the DSN the technology we have here from ground, the maximum accuracy of what you would know is how accurate that is, is within tens to a hundred kilometers, not more than that. And you may, you may you know, question, well, if we go to Mars, uh, 365 million miles, how come we land so precisely? Well, once, once we get near Mars, we do relative navigation. That's a different story. So, for, so therefore, determining the position of the spacecraft from ground is not an option. Now, remember even TPF, you need to bring the spacecraft to within a few meters of each other and take them to kilometers and tens of kilometers. Now, and the reason why you need to do that is that imaging, because you need to start with the origin and then go to the next point, next point. So that means you have to really bring them next to each other very, very closely. 
So to do that, we know we need a special hardware to do that. And that's where all this investment is going to a special metrology systems to develop very high precision, not just the distance, but the vector, to measure the vector. So that comes in the issue of how you actually, how do you, how do you actually measure to deliver a precision that you want, the relative and absolute, as well as the bearing information that is needed to give you the vector information between the two. And that has been an active area of research. This thing right here was invented at JPL that now gives you the capability of at least measuring 2,000 targets at the same time, 2,000 vectors at the same time. That gives you both absolute and relative and the bearing information. And that's something that, that we are very effectively used for some of the uh, uh, DOD missions that we have worked on with, with DARPA. So sensors, propulsion is, is a huge game. Of course, everybody is, has been investing um, millions, if not billions, in propulsion for both interplanetary and the same is for formation flying. For our side, we really are interested in non-contaminating propulsion systems. And, and you know, next charge, I have a, a huge menu of, of what we have, you'll see. But, uh, but communication, software, simulation of distributed network, for, for a space, this is not an easy task. That's simulation capability. We have tried very hard in the past day, 10 years to mature distributed real-time simulation at JPL to a point that we can say that we can now fly in a space without having a problem with time delays, with all the synchronization of the clocks that are extremely difficult, and parallel processing that needs to come in. Now we've got to a point we can do. But if you want to do swarms, it's a different story. And, and then hardware. We put enormous amount of value of having test bits, simulation, and hardware test bits. And we have learned our lessons that we no longer really would like for the first time fly in a spacecraft and know the performance on that spacecraft in space. So we would rather spend a fraction of that cost and do whatever we can do on ground. And, uh, and then what you cannot do on ground, then you go to a space and do that. So I will show you a video of this, how, how we've done this. And then just very quickly, these are the many, if you could read it, of a whole bunch of different technologies we look at from, uh, from the thruster point of view. This obviously is, is uh, our choice. Uh, it has large ISP. It's also non-contaminated. And that gives you, gives you a millinewton or better type of uh, thrusting uh, that can give you the pointing stability and pointing performance that you want for high precision pointers. Other ones is that well, when you deploy a large number of the spacecraft in deep space, how do you know where they are? How could they talk? So they need uh, radio frequency-based, RF-based um, sensors called AFF that we have actually developed. They give you four pi stratian field of view, so, so you can see in front of you and as well as and behind you. We also have algorithms that guarantees no matter where you deploy them in the space, you guarantee that you can actually find where your target is. Now, this is a non-trivial question. You can, you can be two people that keep rotating with the same rate and back to each other without knowing that, that you're in the back of each other. So finding an object in 360 degree or four, four pi stratum is a non-trivial thing. So there are um, algorithms that we actually have published it, um, uh, several years ago that guarantees that we can actually find this. And then we have, you know, this is right outside of JPL on a good, good clear day. We have uh, demonstrated that on kilometers um, before we fly them in the space. Now, we show the cartoon of these, and I apologize for, for this because of ITAR. So we couldn't show the actual hardware. But the optical metrology, we have done that. This is scanning, so it actually gives you the topography of a surface. So if you're trying to identify an unknown spacecraft that the color is not good and the lighting condition is not good, you can actually use this equipment that gives you the nice topography in any lighting condition. And it also can give you very precise range and bearing information as you close in. And, and that is actually to a point that, uh, that we like to, to, to fly it on, on 403, which is a European mission in a couple of years. 
Now here's our lab. Now I put this lab together with tremendous opposition from JPL management because I think that the space that I needed was a very valuable space. And an historical space called uh, Celestarium, that was the very first uh, laboratory that, uh, that JPL or this NASA or this country had used to test the real spacecraft against the real stars. So I wanted this because I wanted my, my spacecraft to actually use the star patterns that now we have put on the ceilings of, uh, of this uh, a dome type uh, place. So basically the architecture that we have gives you opportunity for engineers to sit down and design a particular um, formation of any size in Leo, male, or deep space. They have an opportunity to immediately uh, do uh, their MATLAB and then we actually do the C coding by hand and, and we have reasons for that um, and integrate it into a real-time distributed uh, simulation capability that simulates both the dynamics and the space environment and then uh, test it against a, a simulated uh, robots, dynamics, which are these guys. And then we have a, a, a window that separates us from two large rooms, made several times of this room, and the next door that puts it into wirelessly into an experiment and see where we're failing. So the spacecraft at the beginning starts in a complete uh, tumbling mode. So they have star trackers on board. You will see that in a minute. They identify the stars. They stabilize themselves, they start to communicate, and then we actually put into the test the, um, the software that we have developed for, for various verification purpose. Now I guess I'm, I, my next slides are taking who else is doing uh, the, the distributed, uh, uh, has diffused, distributed platforms. Obviously DLR, MIT has a spheres, as you know, that they're flying on, on a space station. Naval postgraduate has a two degrees of freedom, um, and, and North of Grumman, others, and I'm running out of time, so um, let me say, here a little bit closer to home, I think that um, Dr. Sunju Chong here has, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, there we go, has, has developed his lab as part of the research work that we're doing in the swarm. So this is a very simple, very, um, preliminary setup of large number of helicopters flying, but the issue is not you get the helicopters flying. The issue is that uh, we are really uh, essentially are testing uh, behavior guidance uh, as opposed to deterministic guidance path planning. So you, you're needing, you're essentially developing probability guidance and stochastic guidance. You essentially want to demonstrate you can actually take a gradual degradation of, of a system which was in a string of perils and now you inject it back again and re restructure itself. Now obviously uh, you've got distributed optical sensing on your ceiling and you have a central computer that is commanding, but these are very cheap and expensive hundred dollar helicopters. Uh, so um, excuse the instability that you see, it could have been easily easily taken care of if we would have to spend a few hundred dollars on these uh, on these helicopters, you can also do a coordinated landing, as you can see that they're demonstrating without crashing, that they can do that. So, so this is going on here with lots of good work from Sunju and his students. Um, 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 actually, Daniel is, um, is uh, one of the PhD students who's working on that and is also uh, as one of the students that work with me directly. Now, JPL has worked on ST3, Starlight, and TPF, and, and I'm afraid I will not get that much time to go through these. And, and, and here is a really exciting project that I wanted to see. So you need to realize these are not cartoons and videos. What we did for the Department of Defense was the question, can you actually not assemble but manufacture this type of thing in space? So, so, of course, we have to go through formation flying. We actually have built the material that you will see. Now you can see these are the panels. These are the distributed telescopes that you will see. Now these are the solar panels that are deployed. This is in geosynchronous orbit. So the control system is going to act to, to coordinate this element. You can see that the video was, was uh, shortened here because of being a public domain. 
this material is made out of uh, chemicals that look like the bubbles that you blow in. And that's exactly how it's done in space. That then it's cured and it becomes a reflected surface. So we actually uh, had them, at the, and we built it from Caltech at JPL with, in, in our vacuum chamber. This is the secondary that comes in and joins whenever uh, the space assets are ready and, and then joins with the rest of the formation to make a distributed telescope at an arbitrary size. Now, um, th this was uh, the accuracy and the alignment of these platforms. These are tens of meters, okay, not to be quite accurate. Tens of meters of, of, uh, of aperture coming together to make the primary. And then and the secondary that you saw the instrument will join that. Then your formation flight would become how do you maintain? Now this is the 2000 um, target that I mentioned to you, metrology system that gives you the vector and then this is a telescope that, that DOD was interested to build. Um, another, another application uh, of this is a, a really exciting project that, that we had and this, this is the flight software that you see by the way. Uh, this is spacecraft is inspecting this tumbling a spacecraft, happened to be a, a, you know, an interesting DOD a spacecraft. And, and these are various inertial frame that you see from the sensor view to target view and, and from the uh, local, vertical, local, horizontal on target that you are seeing. So the idea is that you want to dock with a tumbling a spacecraft, stabilize it, and take it to an, a stable orbit. What you need to do is to put yourself into a control tumbling capability. And as you do that, then the sensor and where the dock takes place, they actually close in. So you, you have to synchronize precisely to a, a tumble mode. As is being done, you can see now, that's where the mating is going to take place. And, and, uh, and, and you can imagine all the details of the dynamics and simulation that needs to go into this for the flight software to deliver what's supposed to deliver as an integrated system. So, these are examples, again, as formation flying, simple formation flying of, of the two spacecraft and so forth. One that I'm really excited uh, and I'm presently working on uh, with the Europeans is the Proba 3, which is a collaboration between ESA and, and uh, JPL. Um, the idea is that, uh, which is also true for exoplanet detection, every time that you want to look at a planet that is orbiting in a star, you need, to have, you need to look at the star. So you see, you expose yourself and your instrument to enormous amount of light. So then how do you see that little planet that is orbiting the star? So you need to null it. You need to essentially get to the point that you look at the star, but you don't see the star, but you see the planet. Now for uh, studying of, uh, of sun, ESA has been looking uh, has been having a program called Proba Series, Proba 1, 2, this is 3. And what they're using this time is they're using a external occulter for a chronograph, and the occulter you can see is occulting the sun, and then the chronograph here would be imaging the corona of the sun. So uh, that's a really exciting, um, exciting program because it actually gives us a, a platform that the re control requirements of that platform is even more difficult than the TPFI that I showed you. Um, so so this, is, this is going to be flying our software and our hardware on that too. Now, let me see. Are we going in the right direction? I'm just going to skip. I was hoping to talk about the software here, but we're running out of time. Um, but I'd like to show you at least what the, what the hardware looks like here. Um, We have, uh, we actually have developed a uh, proprietary software at JPL, an architecture called Hydra, that gives an opportunity to, uh, to, to apply it for uh, infinite, uh, in uh, large size of infinite is probably not the right word, large size of the distributed network in the space that takes into account all the issues, including time delay synchronizations of clocks and time tagging issues that is needed. Now this is, um, this is my lab that, uh, that has uh, 
that we have essentially built the robots, the upper stage, upper stage to be as complete as the spacecraft we can get. So it has uh, reaction wheels, it has uh, fire optics gyros, it's got the thrusters, it's got the star trackers, it's got distributed um, um, thrusters, 16 sets that typically would fly on every spacecraft. So we made this as complete as possible. Now, this gives you the vertical stage. So without this, you would have um, five degrees of freedom. And now with this, you would have six and actually have one redundant. So three degrees of freedom, three degrees, and one, which is the vertical stage. Now with these two, now gives us essentially the capability of verifying any type of architectures and algorithm we want from control point of view. So um, the, the thruster on the upper stage is the one that essentially controls the spacecraft. The idea is that can we maintain the baseline, means the separation between the bore side of the two metrology system on the upper stage to uh, as solid as we want. That means zero variability. And then can we essentially maneuver the spacecraft to point to a light source as, as we want. So this is the wireless communication. The communication between the upper stage and lower stage is done through wireless communication. There's no cabling involved. And this is pretty much, I was talking to Professor Farron that, that something about the fractionation is that even within the monolithic systems, we really are getting away from cabling and we're letting the sensors and actuators to communicate to wireless communication. And that came up as a result of this fra fractionation theory. So the formation acquisition means they put yourself into a mode that now you ca are communicating. So we've got light sources that we'd like to, to do and take this exactly through the same scenarios that in simulation you saw about 15 minutes ago using TPL. Um, and unfortunately, again, we, we don't have time. I just want to show you this couple of little things that, that is in, in, in my uh, agenda over the next few years. Uh, and that is uh, talking about going from 5,000 or 6,000 kilogram spacecraft to a 100 gram class spacecraft. And that is, uh, uh, again, another project that Professor Chong and, and multiple other universities and, and industry was involved with us. We now have very clear architecture for a spacecraft that, um, that flies a three grams uh, GPS, that flies a, a, a star tracker or a, or a star camera, which is five grams including electronics. Um, and, and we have a, a complete communication that does not only uh, downlinking, but also would communicate with, with the rest of the spacecraft. And that is targeted, can we actually fly tens of thousands of these together? as either an optical platform or a, a distributed RF platform or you know, other applications including you know, mock-ups in a space to evade um, an enemy attack or something like that. But, but we're after the science. Here's another example. Here's a simulation of, um, of these uh, thousands of the spacecraft in a 550 kilo kilometers that that's low Earth orbit. Now you can see that we use some of these guidance laws that I mentioned to you that, uh, that uh, we, uh, Dr. Uh, Hong is using actually with his students for a smaller number, but these are what it is. This is essentially going to make it a, uh, a reflector telescope or reconfigure it to larger platforms. And, and these, some of these that are standing by would actually will make up if there's a failure or collision. Now, collision avoidance, at the beginning, our responses thought that for this level of 100 gram class was not an issue. We quickly learned that it is a big issue. You will have a pile of mess if you don't do something about it. So we do have, therefore, a metrology system that, that detects the distances between each. Each of these here is another one um, that, that can, uh, like, can self-repair. That means if, in case there is an object that goes through your, your formation, you have some of these guys that have nothing to do to join and optimally position themselves to redo the mission that you want. So now here is what I meant in terms of resiliency. Now when you have distributed network, so what if one or two or three or five of them go bad? Well, you inject it. In, in large monolithic system, if your system um, dies on you, you're done. So you're finished. Uh, for distributed network, you actually can replace them. 
and you're not only for that failure, but also as new technology changes, you actually inject new technology to your system, more capable and larger and, and, and bigger. So um, I, okay, I skipped the challenges, but I want to have time to discuss with you uh, the, uh, the questions that you may have. Um, essentially, I think in summary, there are many, many exciting projects and opportunities and mission concepts that, that are emerging for, uh, uh, for distributed systems and new initiatives. Um, all of them need a really smart vehicles, uh, autonomous systems that can autonomously work together. Forget about ground involvement. If you have one spacecraft that takes um, uh, tens of people to do the mission operation, imagine if you have 20,000 of those, it's just not, not possible. But you do need their own hardware, software, architectures that were barely there, I would say that 20%, to do something like the swarms that I talk you, new testbed concept, I think it's key to the success. Build your testbed, start testing, and, 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 and try to get it off the ground and test it with these CubeSats. I think that's an opportunity that many of us didn't have five or 10 years ago. And, and there's a, a, a lot of stuff going on outside the US. In my view, we're falling behind when it comes to that area. Okay, so I hope I gave you some time for questions. Thanks. Yes? I'm sorry? So uh, in, the, in the astrophysics area and earth science, we obviously have significant involvement from scientists and science community in us. Anything that we do it starts with science. That's our goal. It seems very closely related to like the optics of insects that have multifaceted. Absolutely. In fact, bird swarms. Yes, yes. Why is one Yes. And, you know, and, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with the work that Richard Murray is doing, how they how they actually model the optic, the, uh, the insects, right, eye, and, and the, the issue is that depend on the science that you want to do. If you want to do high precision instrument, you need a little bit better vision as all of us like to have. And, 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 and sensor is what decides the capability of the control you're going to have. So we need therefore high precision methodology system. That is expensive. Uh, but for earth science application, absolutely. You use them for collision avoidance and you don't need to have such a very high precision knowledge of where you are. Just not collide with what you want to do. And from DOD point of view, so long as you don't have GPS in the loop that it could be intercepted, they need that type of technology to go forward. So in, in the two simulations that I had, we went as, as many as 10,000. Now that, remember, we just only modeled point mass. How do you, how do you launch those? Do you launch them uh, just continuously? So, so actually, it's an interesting question. Just think about it and do a little math. You will see that it's, first of all, if it's 100 gram, um, 10 of them would make a kilo. Right. So, so uh, you can do it in sequence. As, as you know, all the spaces that you're not using for uh, a, a secondary or, or even in you know, a lower payload. And you can inject them, preload them, and send them out. Or you can throw them and start the thrusters. I mean, we do have uh, thrusters here that they use uh, nimbium gas as the main propulsion system that can give you tremendous amount of uh, delta V for long duration of time. And that's something else that JPL has worked on for the past decade. You said NIMBIUM? NIMBIUM. Oh, NIMBIUM. Yes. So um, they use uh, about uh, 3,000 volt to gas it. So we start with a dredge it. But we use the sun ray to do that. And we have already demonstrated the technology we can do that. And, and the whole thruster is this big. And, and it fits uh, nicely within the grams they want to. But it gives you tremendous delta V over a long, large period of time and high speed. Yes. Okay, uh, if you have a formation of fans of satellites, you can uh, have a sort of digital network for communication. Yes. Uh, how do they communicate with Earth? OK, so, 
Okay, so that's a good question and is a real issue. Because we want to be so light, um, the, your capability of communicating uh, is very limited uh, to tens of meters to hundreds of meters. Now, the, some of the architectures that are being used is the use of a mother spacecraft that you can communicate to, then they have the downlink capability. But a lot of the applications that are being used or some of the customers are interested, are not even interested to communicate with Earth. If you want to use a reflector surface, an optical reflector, you just essentially use it as a surface that is there. Or if you use them as a decoy, uh, that's where they are. But if you need to communicate, you actually need a different device. And the device is that you have a mothership somewhere, and then you essentially would, would communicate. Yeah. In my view, the biggest issue is still is going to be the guidance and control. Is the control. I mean, think about the estimators that, that you need to use. Even for, um, even for uh, missions like uh, the MMS or, or the 32 spacecraft, that you, you, if you look at the filtering that you need to do, uh, all the architectures from centralized to decentralized, and uh, it's, it's a huge challenge. And very little, really, has been known. I mean, we know the single spacecraft very well. We can navigate it very well. We know how to estimate our state very well. But once you go to distribute it uh, with the limitations that you have in space, in the absence of GPS, I keep emphasizing that, then it becomes really a big issue. And very little is known. I think that probably, uh, uh, not to claim all the credits, but probably most work has been done at JPL uh, in that area. And because we had to do it, because money was available to do that and we had the people to do it uh, for a particular mission. But I think that as this area is expanding and the customer base is expanding and Earth is going to become a really distributed network, as you saw that as a train, different agencies want to actually work within the spacecraft, not necessarily from day one because they put their projects in, in, in risk. They want you that if you're there, let's collaborate now that we both are in space, not let's put my success of my proposal in danger of your failure and your proposal. They don't want to do that. So if you make it to orbit, let's say now let's collaborate. And, and to do that, it's, it's going to be a huge distributed network and, and collaborative uh, uh, scientific research that is going to be going on. Yeah. So now I'm almost to our break. Yeah, thank you very much. We had someone from JPL that came here to encourage you maybe to uh, to give you some flavor of what JPL has been doing in the GNC area. I'm hoping that we would get more Illinois graduates coming to JPL. Our deputy director is from, uh, from Illinois. Our chief, our manager of space technology program is from Illinois. So we do have a large number of people from the communication side, but not enough from control. So. Any other questions? A lot of them from, from Georgia Tech. Though. One, one more? Okay. Yes. Maybe last one. Quick one on your Okay, so remember that uh, the, you, you're talking about micro-Newton level that you want to do. So uh, when, when I was doing, um, when I was doing uh, XS11 for the rendezvous with the, so I had only 15 meters per second delta V. These guys would go to 25 to 30. So that's a lot if you're using micro-Newton. So, and I was using one Newton to three Newton thrusters on that space. So that's pretty huge. The problem with it is that, um, I, and that was the chart that I skipped, that they, they disperse. And if you think that you put them on the same orbit, they're going to stay together, they won't. So you have to really use the thrust of firing for orbit maintenance, as well as the maneuvers. And that's where the real consumption is going to be done. No, actually, it's, you have this, a, a, a a main tank, but it's distributed nozzles that it gives you, right. Exactly, yes, yes. Okay, if it's really quick, we'll take one more. Then we'll break for coffee. I'm sorry, if you could speak a little louder. So you said there's a lot of filtering. Oh yes, estimation, that, yes, yes. 
So um, the most powerful element, of, let's say for the femtoseconds, in fact, the most powerful element of what we have is the processor. Because the whole thing, the one area that I skipped from talking to you about is the fabrication of this. So we really start from a, uh, a, a silicon wafer. And then as we, this, as we actually try like to carve out the space guy, we integrate the components that we have. So the chip that all these things are connected to is the most powerful. Um, remember that Voyager, Voyager 1, which is outside our solar system, is computational capability was much less than the first IBM uh, desktop that you have 32 kilobit that, that probably and it speaks about ages, but I had one uh, when, I, uh, when I first graduated from college. Uh, the, today's capabilities are significantly more. Now, the, the challenge for the future UAVs as well as the spacecraft collaborative systems is to do things on board. One of the functions that is extremely computationally intensive is onboard path planning. And, and so uh, the guidance for these guys are different from the guidance of uh, of the singular spacecraft that has to solve the equation of motion and optimizes that trajectory. So what these guys are using are really just solving a density function, computing a density function. And that's why we use the probabilistic guidance laws and use the law of large numbers to get the convergence. So you work on the behavior control as opposed to exact trajectory control because it's not needed. That's how we do it. Thank you very much for sure. your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. So now you, now you have yes. one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you.